Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is Thursday, April 1st, April Fool's Day 2021. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you're all doing well out there. Title of today's podcast, Stock Market Highs and Jobless Up. So it is Thursday, our typical data dive with respect to initial jobless claims, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And since they have Change the definition of M1 and M2 money stock will, of course, delay that until that data is updated now monthly. So I want to get into market performance since the S&P 500 has hit an all-time high, breaching 4,000, closing above 4,000. So clearly the quasi-threat from ECB President Christine Lagarde, which we mentioned yesterday, of sort of taunting the markets, egging them on bring it on, give us your best shot. Really don't know what the woman's talking about, but nonetheless, she said it. And and clearly, uh, the markets are either not fighting her in central banks, or they actually prove successful to generate these all-time highs on the S&P 500. And of course, we're flirting with all-time highs with uh, even within the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And of course, the Russell 2000, despite its pullback, is, is still around all-time highs as well. So it's all craziness. And of course, across the pond in Europe, the, the German exchange hitting all-time highs. And this is, of course, off the back of the ECB's balance sheet exploding to all-time highs as well. So it's the central bank's world. It's a central banker's paradise for the time being. And this is unfortunately a, a title of today's podcast that we have used somewhat <clears throat> in the past because uh, one index uh, is making an all-time high month after month. And unfortunately, we continue to see jobless claims continue to increase. And as I have stated, I am not going to say that they have declined until we are below where we were during the depths of the great financial crisis. Now, it's interesting to note that with the downward revision, a rare downward revision, it actually took last week's figures slightly below, slightly below where we were during the depths of the great financial crisis, but it was really within a a stone's throw. And of course, this week we're at 719,000 on regular state unemployment. We'll get to that momentarily. Also want to talk about uh, the dollar doom loop scenario because that is still very much in play. And the financial mainstream media was covering a story today about the IMF and how the U.S. Treasury uh, might be sending the IMF $650 billion. Yes, $650 billion. Why? Because they have to support poorer nations, even middle-income nations, need to be supported. Look, folks, I've been telling you about this for the past year, year and a half, even before COVID. Now, obviously, it really came uh, to the foreground with COVID-19 and when we were discussing the demand for U.S. dollars and how other countries were going to likely have to sell off their treasury holdings in order to get a a handle on those dollars, to actually have take physical possession of those dollars so that they could pay off their debts or what have you. And what happened? Well, the Federal Reserve understood this concern, and they said, don't worry about it. Do not sell your treasuries. Please, don't do it. We will open up currency swap lines with you, and we will just use those treasuries that you have as collateral if things get worse, We'll we'll just accept that as collateral and, okay, please don't sell the treasuries. And the reason they didn't want these other countries around the world in mass, basically at the same time, not because of a coordinated effort, just because the simple economics of it, but they said, you know, this would have been uh, a cause to see a spike in treasuries across the curve. There would have been mass selling of treasuries, prices go down, yields go up exact opposite of what the Federal Reserve wanted to see, as well as every other central bank on the planet. They don't want to see their borrowing costs go up. This is an emergency. We have been in an emergency for the past 13 years, and there's no end in sight, especially with the major economies, major central banks. They want to keep the pedal to the metal. They want to keep interest rates at all-time lows for the foreseeable future, next two, three, four years. 
They don't even want to think about, think about, think about, think about, think about, think about raising interest rates. They don't even want to do it. They don't want to have the discussion. So the dollar doom loop scenario is still very much in play. And now you have a little bit more of an aggressive style coming out of the Treasury Department and the IMF to support these poor countries who are struggling, which we have been mentioning. Okay, so I don't know how far $650 billion is going to go in a global economy, but I guess it's something. And of course, it's our money. So we have people continuing to struggle here in this country, but we have to send $650 billion to the IMF so they can disperse it around the globe. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Market performance, we have the dollar index at 92 spot 88, 92 spot 88. Bitcoin is at $59,500 a coin, so flirting with that $60,000 figure. Not too much movement with the currency markets right now. So again, the S&P 500 is now at 4,027 points. Just a great day. Just a great day. And the NASDAQ was up. The Dow was up. Everything was up, 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 up in a way. Why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't it be? It's the central bank's paradise. It's the start of the second quarter. It's got to start off great, right? And it was funny yesterday because, uh, you know, there was... Uh, JP Morgan had issued uh, somewhat of a warning a couple weeks ago about the close of the first quarter. And they were predicting that there was going to be a lot of selling. And of course, that just did not take place. It was quite the opposite, wasn't it? So you can never take these guys uh, at their word. Of course, I don't listen to them. I don't take their advice. It's something to pay attention to when some of these bigger banks speak. Sometimes it's better to do the opposite but then you can get in trouble doing that too. So it's best really not to pay attention to any of them. We have the Japanese markets flirting with the 30,000 point level once again, despite their little bit of a pullback that they've been witnessing over the past uh, couple weeks as well, but flirting with 30,000 yen on the Nikkei 225. Pretty much a sea of green across the pond today in Europe, uh, despite the fact that uh, French President Emmanuel Macron is, has declared another four-week lockdown nationwide in France, as we discussed yesterday. Just a continuation, as what I'm calling the global Milgram experiment, to simply see how far they can push people to simply listen to an authority, to a, to an authority figure. Excuse me. And the Australian cash trade put on a gain earlier today of about six-tenths of 1%. Commodities rallied. WTI, $61.45 a barrel. Brent, $64.86. Natural gas, $2.63. Oil putting on a gain of over 3% on both WTI and on Brent. Gold and silver both had decent days. Of course, they've been selling off, so this was a, perhaps just a re relief rally. Gold is at $1,730 an ounce. Silver, $24.97 an ounce, excuse me. And copper is still flirting with $4 per pound. And Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note is yielding 1.67%, so a slight decrease there from its recent high. Um, nothing to be concerned about at this juncture. But of course, you still have Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note at 1.67%, yet uh, who cares? Evidently, the NASDAQ, the tech-heavy sector uh, index, does not care. Now, for the past few weeks, when we've been witnessing this increase in yields, that it was supposedly cause for concern. It was the rotation narrative. It was the rotation trade out of the NASDAQ, out of tech stocks, out of these growth names and into value plays, etc., etc. Well, clearly not over the past few sessions where we continue to see money pouring in to those same stocks that we were told money was leaving. It's all a game, folks. It's just a game. It's just for your attention. They have to talk about something because they're on they're on the airwaves for eight hours, depending on which station it is. It's almost all day. They need something to talk about. Whether it makes sense or not, they'll just change the story on you to whatever fits their purpose. I just want you to understand that. But that's some of the market performance. Let's get to the initial jobless 
report here. Initial jobless claims report. So for the week ending March 27th, initial claims seasonally adjusted come in at 719 Thousand. This is a week-over-week -week increase of 61,000. Non-seasonally adjusted comes in at about 714,000, a week-over-week -week increase of 63,000. With continuing jobless claims for the week ending March 20th, it lags a week. So on a seasonally adjusted basis, we come in at around 3.8 million. This is a week-over-week -week decrease of 46,000. On a non-seasonally adjusted basis, we come in at about 4.1 million, a week-over-week -week decrease of about 91,000. Initial claims for the week ending March 27th for the PUA program, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, comes in at about 237,000, a week-over-week -week decrease of some 4,000. So you just have to understand when we talk about initial jobless claims, we're talking about regular states. So that's the 719,000 figure. But we also have, because of Nobody Cares Act 1.0 and its continuation through various versions, the PUA program also has initial claims. And we read these off. So again, this figure is 237,000. So you really have to understand that it's in aggregate. You have to look at that regular state figure at 719,000, and you also have to add up the 237,000. So the PUA program has been in the 200,000 range, quarter of a million. Okay, obviously it depends on when we're talking about, but it's been pretty consistent. Okay, and of course, where have we been on regular state unemployment has been north of 700,000. So do the math. We have been around a million, if not higher, for the past year. That's how devastating and destructive these lockdowns and restrictions have been and continue to be on this economy. It, it is utterly destructive. It's criminal at the end of the day is what it is. And then in aggregate for the week ending March 13th, remember the aggregate lags a couple of weeks for regular state, federal employees, newly discharged veterans, PUA, PEUC programs, extended benefits, state additional benefits, and work share gives us a grand total of 18.2 million. 18.2 million for the week ending March 13th. This is a week over week decline of about one and a half million. So we have been continuing to see when it comes to the aggregate, this, these big swings, quite volatile. Several hundred thousand weak swings to the negative, to the positive, million and a half, two million, plus or minus. And of course, this is because governments, state governments, keep changing their minds, restrictions, lockdowns, open up, close back down, the distortionary effects of what's taking place at the fiscal, at the federal fiscal level. So this is what I have been discussing since last year when they started these programs, when they passed the Nobody Cares Act. I said, we're never going to have uh, a true picture of what's taking place with respect to the jobs market because there are too many distortionary effects in play. And that's what we continue to see. And so with the $1.9 trillion piece of crap that was passed, and we continue to see those distortionary effects that are going to continue well through the summer into uh, early fall, uh, when we continue to have eviction moratoriums extended for the next few weeks, or I'm sorry, the next few months till the end of June. And of course, that can, can get kicked down the road again, too, once we get closer to the end of June. So these are all distortionary effects, folks. None of this stuff has been rectified, and an infrastructure bill... It's not going to solve the day. It's not even going to come close. In fact, it's just going to add to the problems because I'm sure that these people are not going to manage the infrastructure projects very well. Call me cynical, but I just have a feeling that they're not going to do too good a job on it. I hope I'm proven wrong on that. And of course, you know, it's going to be a heated debate in Congress. Mitch McConnell, the uh, Republican leader in the Senate, has stated that no single Republican in the Senate is going to vote uh, for the infrastructure package as it currently stands. That is not a surprise. Again, the Republican Party is a great minority party because when they're out of power, that is when they stand together. That is when they are principled uh, and actually attempt to do something good for the country. When they're in power, however, all bets are off. All their principles 
are, are thrown out the window. They couldn't care less. They add to the problems that ail this country. They put the burden on uh, younger generations and future generations. They couldn't care less. But as soon as they're out of power, oh, 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 moral and righteous they become. Stop falling for it. Stop voting for these people. Stop supporting these people. All of them. And of course, I have nothing but bad things to say about the Democratic Party because they are complete lunatics and destroying this country left and right, fiscally, socially, culturally, everything. I, I, I don't even know what to call the Democratic Party anymore. I really don't. These people are on, they're on some type of medication or they need to be put on some type of medication. It, something's wrong. Something is wrong. When you're calling out Dr. Seuss, something's wrong. Something's wrong when you call out Mr. Potato Head. Something is wrong with you. It's like you got to shake him. What is going on here? Dr. Seuss and Mr. Potato Head. Who wakes up and says, yeah, Dr. Seuss is a racist and Mr. Potato Head. If this is what is on your mind, you got a problem. It's really the only way to put it. But back to the report. Sorry for that. Back to the report. So if you're looking at the grand total here, 18.2 million, it gives us a de facto unemployment rate of about 12.8%, which is still twice as high as the official rate that stands at 6.2%. And of course, tomorrow should be the release of the March jobs report. And numbers vary from market expectations as to what that figure is going to be. And of course, Remember, the jobs report is what is being called out by the Federal Reserve as inaccurate. They say, no, it's not 6.2%. It's really closer to 10. So this report, as we've always said since we've been covering it, you know, it's really just a piece of propaganda at the end of the day. But now the Federal Reserve doesn't even want to deal with it because it doesn't fit their narrative. It doesn't fit their piece of propaganda. So we'll see what comes of it, and we'll report on it like we have been for the past year. We'll read it in its entirety, and we'll go through it and see um, where any strength lies and where, uh, where the weakness continues. So we'll see what comes of that. Now onward to the IMF. So again, this is out of U.S. News and World Report. IMF $650 billion liquidity boost could happen in August, according to U.S. Treasury officials. So a $650 billion increase in international monetary fund reserves could be distributed to member countries in August, but only a small portion is likely to be converted to hard currency by poor countries. The Treasury has formally notified Congress of its plan for the new allocation of IMF special drawing rights, SDRs, starting a 90-day consultation process that will be completed in early July. While the amount is below the threshold requiring approval by Congress, let me repeat this. While the amount, $650 billion, is below the threshold requiring approval by Congress. So basically, if the executive branch, if Janet Yellen and company want to give $650 billion away, and of course those are our dollars, they can do it. They don't even have to go to Congress. Is that not an outrage? The $650 billion SDR allocation must be approved by the IMF's Board of Governors. Oh, they're not going to take free money. Made up by the institution's 190 member countries. Treasury said the expansion aims to provide additional liquidity. Again, it's all about liquidity to countries struggling with the coronavirus pandemic, helping to avoid debt problems. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Dollar doom loop, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. $650 billion, that's almost the size of TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program that was passed to save this country during the depths of the GFC from complete financial ruin. Now, Congress doesn't even need to approve it. Fantastic. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Dingbat Yellen first backed the SDR allocation, previously opposed by the Trump administration in late February. Of course, Dingbat's going to be for it. She never turns down 
the chance to give away free money. Last week, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva said she would present the fund's smaller executive board with a $650 billion SDR expansion proposal by June. Oh, how nice of her. Some Republicans in Congress have criticized the move for providing reserves to rich countries that don't need them, as well as to countries they view as U.S. adversaries, including China, Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. They have also raised concerns about more U.S. borrowing needed for countries to convert their SDRs to hard currency. The U.S. Treasury officials said that only about 2% of the last SDR allocation of about $250 billion back in 2009 was exchanged for underlying currencies. SDRs are made up of dollars, euros, yen, sterling, and Chinese yuan. This time around, the percentage is likely to be higher given countries' continued spending needs to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, but still small. About 70% of the allocation will go to G20 countries, which have more resources and are seen as unlikely to cash in their SDRs. According to a Treasury fact sheet, low-income countries would get about $21 billion in SDR reserves, with about $212 billion going to other emerging market and developing countries, excluding China. The United States retains the right to refuse to purchase SDRs from any country whose policies run counter to U.S. interests. This is according to the Treasury Department. Many large countries, such as most advanced economies and China, already hold excess SDRs and are unlikely, very unlikely, to request to exchange their new SDRs for hard currency, also according to officials at the Treasury Department. Dollars exchanged for SDRs would come from Treasury Exchange Stabilization Funds, but these would need to be replenished by issuing new Treasury debt. Why not? Why not? Yellen has said the net cost to taxpayers is a wash. Oh, there's nothing to worry about, folks. It's going to be a wash, according to Dingbat Yellen, because interest collected on the SDR holdings would offset interest paid on the debt. Just give away $650 billion, doesn't need Congress's approval, and don't worry, it's all going to come out, it'll it'll just be a wash. The Treasury official said progress had been made on increasing transparency about the use of the SDRs, but said work was still continuing on ways for richer countries to loan their SDRs to countries that needed them. The current system allows such donations only to the poorest countries, but UN officials and civil society groups are pushing to ensure access for heavily indebted middle-income countries as well. So there you have it, folks. Another $650 billion is going to go out the door, out the window come August to a whole bunch of other countries. And this will be the Treasury's attempt to prevent another sell-off in treasuries, because a lot of these countries obviously hold a lot of U.S. dollar-denominated debt. They issue it themselves. That's what gives a bid to the debt that those other poor countries are issuing, because if a prospective bond investor understands that they're going to be paid back in dollars, well, then they're going to be more likely to take that gamble and buy those bonds. But if it was going to be in that country's respective currency, which could be quite volatile, they say, yeah, I don't trust this currency. I don't want to be paid in that currency, but I'll take U.S. dollars. So when we have this economic recession and global depression that we are in, when we still have, you know, a lot of inflation taking place, especially in a lot of these poor and mid-tier countries, some of it's runaway inflation, depending on where you are. This is not a good situation. This is not a good environment. This can spiral out of control quite quickly, quite quickly. And depending on what continues to happen with the U.S. dollar, if it continues to increase, could that finally start to put some downward pressure on commodity prices? Nothing goes straight up and nothing goes straight down. So there could be a relief in some of these high-flying commodities. They could come down, they could correct, they could consolidate. And a lot of these poorer nations and mid-tier middle-income countries, they are dependent on commodities. So they could end up facing really a double whammy here, which is all a part of the dollar doom loop. Their, their, their source of survival, whether that's oil, natural gas, metals, what have you, if those prices should go down because of a strengthening dollar, their income, their tax receipts 
are going to go down, and many of them are already fighting high levels of inflation. They are heavily indebted to begin with, with U.S. dollar-denominated debt. It's now going to take more of their dollars, more of their currency, so more of their resources, more of their economic output to pay off those debts as opposed to reinvesting it in their economy for future growth. So you can see and understand how bad this can get. This was of great concern back in March and April of last year once these shutdowns and lockdowns were really imposed uh, globally. Globally. That was a concern. We covered that extensively last year. And we said it never went away. When we talk about the dollar index and we do market performance segments, I say consistently that we can still see a swan song with the U.S. dollar. It could still go up because it's the cleanest shirt in the laundry. It's not great. All of these fiat currencies are garbage at the end of the day. It's a race to the bottom. But they trade relative to each other. So it's just a question as to which one is appreciating or depreciating against the other. And we have seen some dollar weakness over the past year, so it's no surprise to see somewhat of a relief rally. And is that all it's going to be? Or is this something that might be a little bit more concerning? And even if we do continue to see a run-up in the dollar index, that does not necessarily mean that that is going to put downward pressure on commodity prices. Why? Because these markets are broken. They are busted. They are manipulated. They are distorted. Every which way. So we could see a breakdown in those traditional and historical correlations, where one would typically see, if you have a increasing and strengthening dollar, you would typically see weaker commodity prices because most commodities are priced in dollars. That might not happen, or it may. Your guess is really as good as mine at this juncture because of how distorted and how busted and broken these markets are. Despite the fact that we have all of this debt, despite the fact that we have a growing twin deficit, meaning our trade deficit hitting record highs, meaning our budget deficit, our national deficit hitting record highs, we have the dollar increasing, and yet we had gold and silver selling off which is quite ridiculous. But I looked at it as an opportunity. I added to my positions. I put my money where my mouth is. I don't give financial advice here. I give the macro picture. I tell you what I do. I tell you perhaps where to look for your own portfolios, but I don't tell you what to do. But I've been stating to this audience for quite a while that I am a long-term bull when it comes to precious metals and commodities. And when I see this pullback in gold and silver and mining stocks, it's an opportunity to buy how I look at it. Could I be proven wrong? Of course. Of course. But I'm sticking with it because I still think those are fundamentals. I don't think uh, that this is the last hurrah for gold and silver, that it's going to be outdone by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. This is that the cryptocurrencies, this is their first rodeo. And this is not small potatoes that we are dealing with here. This is a global recession, global depression type environment. Understand this. So if you want to think that, you know, cryptocurrencies is going to be the savior, it's your money, it's your risk, do what you want. But gold and silver have proven the test of time. And commodities are going to be needed. Needed is the key word here. This is not about discretionary income. This is about survival. And so you need real things. You need energy, you need food. And I just simply look at gold and silver as monetary metals, but I also look at silver as uh, an industrial metal as well, which is also quite shocking given the infrastructure plan that's coming down the pike, which is basically the Green New Deal. It's a, it's a version of the Green New Deal. And of course, wackadoo AOC, she doesn't think it goes far enough, but you know, surprise, surprise. So it's interesting to see that beat down. But sometimes markets give you a gift. Buy low, sell high. Got to have a long-term outlook on these things. So there you have it. Stock market highs and jobless, unfortunately, continue higher from the prior week. Oh, and lastly, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet uh, was down slightly 
week over week, about $30 billion, and is now sitting at $7.69 trillion. $7.69 trillion on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, still flirting, obviously, with all-time highs. And this has sort of been the pattern that we have witnessed week over week. It'll hit an all-time high. It'll come down just a little bit and then back up. Look it up. It's what it is. The, the graph is clearly increasing, and we project Federal Reserve balance sheet of at least $8.5 trillion by the end of the year, probably closer to 10 especially if Congress continues to spend more money. And if Dingbat Yellen just says, here's $650 billion to the IMF, yeah, we got to issue uh, more debt, but it, it'll just be a wash. Don't worry about it. D don't worry about it. Okay? It's good to know that we have nothing but the best and brightest and competent minds working for us in Washington, D.C. Don't you feel confident? Stock market highs and jobless up. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I'm Alex Caritas. Godspeed.